television It's headfirst only television It's good, says Ryoko Music. So let's um, let's go back to the main webcam and relax. Um, yeah, it's been a weird old day. But I have been doing my homework. So this evening, as promised, I'm going to talk about um, writer's block. Hello, welcome to Twitch. Um, thank you for following me, if you're following me, if you're just swinging by to see what the bloody hell I'm going on about creating tons of Echo, then now you know this happens at least once a week and uh, as Array of Emotions and Ryako Music say, I am cursed in here. I have a feeling it's something to do with the environment I'm working in, which is suboptimal and... It's getting to me. The, when the description in Twitch says the studio's under the bed, I'm not kidding. And it's one of these old Argos aluminium, uh, aluminium frame jobs. So there's a ladder that you climb up to, to get into the bed. And the... There's a nice desk, you know, it's quite quite a big desk. There's probably about um, 80 or 90 centimetre pitch on everything, so I can fit the, the mixer on there. There's also um, my Mackie Studio controller, which is the source of most of my problems at the moment, it has to be said. And um, as you can see, there's even room for a lava lamp on the end. But the keyboard that slides out, there's a little keyboard shelf, is at one end. Um, my speakers, I've got one speaker right next to that camera. The other speaker's pretty much at the end of the shelf on this thing under the bed. But um, I have to move if I want to get in the sweet spot, which is about here, for my near-field monitors. And um, this week, scuttling backwards and forwards in this chair has just really been winding me up. I don't know why. I've had this set up like this now for uh, five or six years. And every year I keep on saying, one day I'll get rid of this bed and make this place actually look like a studio rather than some teenager's, obsessive teenager's bedroom. And uh, I have a feeling, yeah, a ray of emotion says, do it. And I think to celebrate the fact that I'm going to be 60 on Tuesday, I think I'm going to bite the bullet and order myself a desk. And then we'll cross the bridge of getting rid of this bed and taking it apart and dismantling everything that's on it. Um, when I come to it, but uh, I th I think it has to be done. Oh, I can hear a nasty buzz. I think I might be winding the uh, the mic mechanic up a bit too much. That seems to have got rid of it. Let's uh, wind the the zoom up a bit. So yeah, uh, more gear, uh, more pulling everything apart and giving it another opportunity to go wrong. Hooray! Um, but it's got to the point where the the whole of this setup is just beginning to irritate me. Uh, a ray of emotion says, you'll need some help moving everything, nudge, nudge. Yeah, I, I, I will probably kill myself if I try doing this on my own. Uh, so uh, all help gratefully received, all offers of help gratefully received. But it will not take place 
before the weekend of the 14th and 15th of August. Because it's Formstock. It's February Album Writing Month's online version of the Form Is Over global party that has been held every year for the past donkey's years. And I've been asked to take part. And after umming and ahhing and panicking, as I always do, um, I've said yes. So I will be taking part. Don't know when on the schedule. Could be three o'clock in the morning UK time, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But that's uh, not this weekend coming, but the weekend after. And I'll probably do something like this. I'll just turn the cameras on and just talk about processes and creativity and everything like that. And I may actually create something in my hour-long slot. I might actually say... I'm going to make a piece of music with vocals in an hour live on whatever streaming platform Formstock is using. That's the plan. Um, stay tuned. <laughs> Mel, maybe they just don't have your address. So uh, who knows? Um. Anyway... Please follow me on Twitch if you haven't already. Hello to new followers. I picked up a couple new followers this week, which is brilliant. Um, friend me if you don't want to follow me. Whatever. It's all good. It all helps. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube after the fact, uh, check out my leaked editing skills. I'm getting quite good at this now. I've got to the point where most of the downloadable versions of this are more than 10 minutes, sometimes even 15, 20 minutes shorter than the versions that you actually get to watch live. So you get special content watching this live that does not become available on YouTube. I hope you appreciate this, which is my way of putting the spin on the fact that all the drivel and umming and eyeing and hesitation and repetition that is an integral part of the live experience gets cut out for the YouTube. Um, there are separate YouTube playlists for all of these Thursday night shows, which are kind of more general. Well, this is what I'm doing this week. How are you guys? Uh, and the 5090 shows, which take place on Sunday nights, which are usually a little bit shorter and feature me pontificating about some element of the creative process in home recording your own music and there are slides but there are even going to be slides tonight because that's how carried away I've got. So if you're watching this on YouTube, hello, um, I hope you like the edits, please subscribe, please follow me or whatever else you do, please click the little notification bell down there to be informed of when new content arrives. And at the moment, you'll be getting between three and four hours of new content a week, uh, which has completely freaked YouTube out. And my analytics keep on saying, well, you, uh, you're 181% more viewers than you were last week. So, so that's YouTube. Uh, what else? Health. Yes, I am still wearing the brace. Um, Helen, bless her cotton socks, is trying to convince me that I've just sprained something. But after looking on the NHS website, I am now convinced I've got tennis elbow because all the symptoms are there. The inability to extend after periods of immobility and all sorts of stuff like that. And of course, tennis elbow takes between six months and two years to clear up. So, yay. Um, as a result, I haven't played any guitar since the weekend I've put together my little minute and a half of prog rock exquisite corpse delta uh, which I am going to send off to Stefan if you're watching you'll be getting that tomorrow because I've nearly finished it I promise and thank you very much for your well wishes by email so yes I am I have been doing I have been doing the progs Boy, have I been doing the progs. As a result of not playing guitar or bass or stick, 
I have been result resorting to playing that lot just with the right hand and virtual instruments and stuff on Ableton. And the Abletons are really getting a little bit over the top at the moment. This was, and you remember the photograph of the lamppost in Edinburgh that I showed you a couple of weeks ago? The, the signs, they are continuing to inspire me. We are now on the third of the four signs on the lamppost in Edinburgh. Uh, this one was for a chicken whisperer. And as before with, um, what was the one before? Frog Juggler. So Frog Juggler was, <laughs> Mother Cluckers indeed, says Ryaka Music. Frog Juggler was in 5-4. Where are you going to go when you've done 5-4? Well, of course, you're going to go 7-8, aren't you? So I did this piece, um, which kind of started off tubular bells and ended up sort of, um, Philip Glass a go go. Do you want to hear a bit of it? Shall I play it through? <laughs> Complete silence from the chat. Well, uh, I'm going to do it anyway. So this this is Chicken Whisperer.
So yeah, uh, Riaco Music says this is very different from what you normally make, but it's great. Well, thank you. Um, very different indeed. I mixed it down and mastered it and played it back, making sure that the levels were right. And after throwing ozone and tonal balance control on it, and at the end of it, it was like, no, that's that's, that's not me. I don't do stuff like this. I mean, we've, as Rioco Music will testify, we've we've dabbled in Bond theme type orchestrations in the past, but um, I don't know where this stuff is coming from. Is the simple way of putting it. It's it's like getting the BBC Symphony Orchestra Discover package has unlocked some form of of strange hitherto unaccessed trove of of ideas and Atitlan says the bass trombones own pretty much everything they're put on one of the best yeah absolutely one of the best sounds in BBC Symphony Orchestra and great the cellos I really like although you've got to really play with the um, expression on them otherwise they do town Riaka Music says BBC Symphony levelled you up it did um, still not sure I'll be levelling up to the to the bigger version just yet because uh, that's loads of money or put it like this I'll be spending less money getting myself a proper studio desk than buying the uh, than buying the, the next version of the BBC Symphony Orchestra but um, let's have a big shout out to Spitfire Labs Spitfire Audio for creating the opportunity for people like myself and quite a few of the people in chat to play with a symphony orchestra and do it in a way that actually sounds like we could quite possibly have got access to a real symphony orchestra for the size of the download. It is an astonishing achievement. And the more I use it, the more I love it to bits. And I am likely to be using it quite a bit at the moment until this bugger heals. So um, we'll see where it leads. So that was Chicken Whisperer, which leaves me. And I've already got one or two very silly ideas for the one remaining Edinburgh lamppost sign which is squirrel matador now do i go flamenco can't because i can't play guitar so um yeah i've got a few ideas and none of them are good so we'll <laughs> we'll see where they end up so um Despite that being song number 17, and I've actually made a start on song number 18 today, I'm still behind the curve. I should be at least 18 songs in at this point during 5090, the purpose of which is to write 50 songs in the 90 days between the 4th of July and the 1st of October. It's something that I do every year. I've done it for the past eight years. I have a ridiculous ridiculously stupid amount of fun doing it uh quite a few of the people in chat i did not know before i started doing february album writing month or 5090 and um my life is very much better for having done february album writing month and 5090 and i intend to continue doing so uh for the foreseeable Rioco music says bust out some castanets hmm that's one thing I don't have. What I do have, I've been to the DIY shop. Bear with me. <laughs> My local branch of B&Q sells these really, really good plastic storage crates with sort of securable lids. And they're like a fiver each. So I've got um, about a dozen of them. And the latest one I bought, I've labelled noisy things this is my miscellanea junk shop chris why don't you have this box 
and it has um, stuff that I've basically made noises with in the past over the years, but um, they don't really live out in the studio and get regular use. You'll kind of see why. So let's let's go for the um, the comedy aspect first. Thank you very much to Rebecca who gave me this when we found it in her loft. I think this was uh, taken off her father or grandfather's car because it does work. <coughs> How about that? Acidland says sampler food. Yeah, I think I'd need a bulletproof microphone to, to sample this. And, of course, February album writing month staple. Yes. More cowbell. Uh, there are... I mean, good God. Oh, it's dead. That needs a new piece of um, paper in it. Dead kazoo. Um, various wooden f pipes. I have no idea where these came from. I think they may well have been brought back from holidays by relatives. This one's split, it, probably because it's dried out, but... Yeah, decent sound on it. A couple of, pen couple of penny whistles as well. So... Enough of that. So, to be honest, the noises I make putting everything back in the box are probably more musical than the stuff I'd make making with these, but we'll see. Now, why, if that fitted in in the first place, is it not fitting in now? Oh, there we go. So, um... M. Knights, good evening. Um, this is nice. Getting people dropping by, hanging in. Thank you for stopping by. So, yeah. Um, I've been fiddling around with gear in terms of this, uh, which you probably can't see because it's... it's... So, the, the configuration of this wretched mic stand continues to annoy me. So what I've done is I've got, um, it's actually a quick release mount because, and this is, this is, this is one of the design niggles of the SM7B and the Shure Super 55 is the same. That is the XLR socket and that's the mount for the 5 eighths threaded screw thing. And down there, it was getting in the way, and I couldn't actually manoeuvre the mic properly. So uh, with, this, with this quick release arm, not only does it quick release the mic so I could swap it over for something else, it also raises the Super 55 so that the XLR socket is um, out of the way of the rest of the stand. So it's a bit more in the way, but it's actually a lot easier to use. And uh, it's a lot more adjustable too. So I'll be fiddling with this all night, I can tell. Uh, there are all, all more things to tighten and uh, loosen, and it'll probably fall off the stand at some point. And if it does, because the, uh, the road mic stand arm is spring loaded the mic stand arm will spring up and hit the ceiling because this equipment is cursed and i says i sent my survey in for the bbc spitfire library thank you for informing me about it head first only good man you will join our cult and and it is a cult because it will suck you in the the level of stuff you can do even if you just playing the celeste or the or the gong even it's it's worth filling in the questionnaire just for the gong sample believe me um and you get timpani and it's funny i posted this on on 5090 a few days ago 
and it does sound incredibly tubular bellsy at the beginning i mean especially when the celeste drops in so this is piano and celeste which is not making any noise why is that not making any noise so here we are again with another conundrum what have what have i done ladies and gentlemen to render ableton completely silent how very strange and i'm just gonna i'm just gonna shut ableton down and and open it again uh, which is no i'm not going to save any changes i uh, check your preferences indeed who are uh, misses um i'll tell you what why don't we come on to the main body of this evening's entertainment uh, which is a little guide that I put together about overcoming writer's block. So, yes, it's a 5090 show guide, but I thought I'd do it today because um, it's fresh in my mind and Mel had given me some good ideas to sort of start thinking about. Ladies and gentlemen, a very, very quick, um, it's, what, about a dozen slides, overcoming writer's block. So first of all, the usual disclaimer, your mileage may vary. This is my take on a highly subjective, complex topic. So feel free to disagree violently with anything that I mention because it's just based on my experience and a bit of reading that I've done over the years and a few books that I've read, such as The Inner Game of Music and various creative how-to things. So what is writer's block? Hey, I didn't know this, but writer's block as a term only dates back to 1947. Although people have talked about it since, you know, time immemorial, people were complaining about having writer's block back in the 1200s. But Edmund Burglar, who was uh, a European psychologist who moved to the States uh, and made quite a name for himself in a number of fields of psychology, coined the term writer's block and described it as neurotic inhibitions of productivity. It's basically when you can't think of what you want to do. There is a quote that is allegedly from Thomas uh, Ernest Hemingway, which is, creativity is staring at your typewriter until blood comes out of your forehead. It's not actually... A Hemingway quote at all. It dates back to another guy from about 30 years previously. And uh, if I'd been more organised, I would have written down the name of the guy who actually said it. But it's on Quote Investigator, which is a brilliant site. I can highly recommend it. So there isn't one type of writer's block. There are a whole bunch of types of writer's block, and they all have different causes. And one cause can be perfectionism and self-criticism that don't want to let go of what it is you're working on because it's not good enough yet. There's self-doubt or emotional distress, uh, all of the above. A lot of this has to do with things like imposter syndrome of thinking, well, you know, this is just what I do, but I'm not really a proper musician, so I shouldn't impose it on the world. And there may be more deeply seated causes of emotional distress that are impinging on your ability to create. And depression, anxiety and or stress can play a very, very big role in how much you feel inclined to do something musical. Speaking from personal experience, I know that all too well. And there's also an aversion to criticism or comparison with others. In other words, you've got a really good opinion of your work, but if you say it's finished and release it to the wider world, then that opinion may be challenged. And that is one of the primary causes of procrastination. So, yeah, I'll, 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 it's not quite finished yet. I'll put it out some sometime in the future. Because you really don't want to find out how good or otherwise your stuff really is. 
To which I say, dude, forget it. Just put it out there. Move on to the next thing. Reaco Music says, dude, that's like me every day. Yeah, same. So there's a nice little article in the American Journal of Neuro... I can't remember what the R stands for, but that's the reference. So you can go and read about the history of writer's block and the basic fundamental causes of it. So it's all very well knowing what causes it. What are you going to do about it? Well, the emotional content or the emotional drives that are stopping you from doing stuff are what you've got to work on. You've got to turn off your inner critic. The little voice. <laughs> Mel says, cry and eat cookies. Always works for me. Turn off your inner critic. The little voice that says, oh, you don't want to, you don't want to show that to anybody else. It's not really good enough. Sod that. <laughs> Atitlan says, procrastination's not writer's block. It's a methodology. Yeah, I feel you, mate. That's very much, very, very true too. So disengage from emotions means... Give yourself the freedom to play. Don't worry about the emotional impact of what it is you're creating. Just just do something anyway. Do something different. Break the mould. Think out of the box. Do something different. Play. Change your creative focus. So if there was one aspect of the work that is really stopping you moving forward, then put it to one side. Do another aspect of the work. Leave the editing till later. So by that, I mean, just get the ideas down. Don't worry about ranking them in order and then only working on the good ones. Work on all of them. That's the point. I mean, this is why we do 5090. I am already at the point and I reach this point probably less than 14 songs in of going, oh, well, it's not really good enough, but I'll upload that and do another one because I've got to get numbers up. And that is why February Album Writing Month and 5090 work, because they give you that deadline as an excuse to say, well, yeah, this isn't really finished, but what do you think? And let you move on to something else without polishing it until there's nothing actually creatively sparked left. Leave the editing till later. Just get it out the door, move on to the next one. And then finally, sidestep your internal judgment. So again, it's rather than if you can't turn off your inner critic and some people's inner critics can be very persistent, as I know from experience, then give it something else to work on. Fake it out. Do I'm trying to think of the American football manoeuvre where they make you go one way and I can't remember it and... I'm, I'm not a sports ball type thing. And Riaco Music says eat more cookies. Well, that will work. That's, that's, that's step number six, although it's not on the slide. So let's move through these in order. Silence your inner critic. The little voice that says, no, 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 don't do it like that. Why are you doing that? Easiest way, make the task you're doing hard enough to fully occupy your brain so that you have to pay full attention to the task. Make it difficult. I think this is one of the reasons why I'm really enjoying moving from synthesizer, guitar, bass, drums and vocals to an entire symphony orchestra with two sets of violins, violas, celli, basses, horns, bass trombones, tenor trombones, the works, the difficulty that I'm assigning to my task is now much higher than it was so I've got to pay full attention to it I don't have any cognitive slack left because not only is it difficult I'm pushing my current skill level such as it is or isn't to its absolute maximum my brain doesn't have enough capacity left to worry about what I'm doing is good enough I'm too busy focusing on the task and the skills that I need to make that task happen. And there's no room for emotions, no room for doubts. In fact, if you do this properly and you really max yourself out, you don't even notice time going past. It has a name. 
that process or that condition that you find yourself in is known as flow after Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, who was the psychologist who discovered it as a result of investigating why people in the middle of civil wars in uh, Eastern Europe were leading happy and fulfilling lives. Guppy Wigber, good evening, Jules. Uh, Atitlan says, orchestra also gives a structure to work within rather than the infinite sound choices of synths. Choice paralysis. Oh, yes. Choice paralysis. When you have a synthesizer package that offers you 6,500 different presets and the capacity to fiddle with about 100 different controls, you tend to think, oh, I'll just use a piano. So... Chick sent me high has a TED talk. That's the reference to it. Flow, the secret to happiness. Google it. It's glorious. And as I said the last time I mentioned it, there's also a brilliant nod to um, flying saucers and a certain eminent psychologist of the 1930s. Flow's a great place to be, quite rare, unfortunately. Yeah. You can make it happen more often. You can learn to get into flow. But the main thing is to focus on these two qualities of the task that you're doing, difficulty and skill level. So watch the TED Talk. Get yourself in flow if you possibly can. Push yourself, challenge yourself. Do stuff that you thought might be a bit too difficult. If you crash and burn, so what? You crashed and burned, but you probably learned a lot. Next subject, give yourself the freedom to play. Don't assign consequences to any of this. If you don't like it, then just put it on your shelf. But make something. Have fun making something. Don't bother about showing it to anybody else. Just make something for the pure joy of making it. Even if you're stuck on something else, go off and do something that you really like. Doodle. You know, draw something. Do something that's creative, but maybe in a different genre. So one of the things that I use an awful lot when I'm sort of figuring out playing is mind maps. You might recognise the name Tony Bazan, sadly passed away last year. Bazan sounded like quite a character, but he was very, very hot on, on popularising mind maps as a way of organising your thinking. It wasn't a new idea. Somebody summarised one of Ptolemy's lectures using a mind map, and they go back to at least the 3rd century AD. They're a type of spider diagram, so they're a way of drawing logical connections between things and organising things that are common together. So, divert your mind by making a mind map of the task that you want to create, and... Here's one I did earlier. So this is my mind map of notes for what we're doing now. So these are the various areas that I identified and said, OK, what am I going to talk about? Well, I'm probably going to talk about most of these. Some of them I dropped out, the album project there. Write a series of songs with the same titles as those on a favourite album. Yeah, OK. Atitlan says, yep, easily distracted. Most songs I get to a certain point and then it flows, but crossing that threshold doesn't happen easily. I get into flow mixing easier than composing, and lyrics are really hard at the moment. Not sure cookies will help. Willing to try. Always try cookies. Take it from Chris. Always try cookies. If you get stuck, there are ways that you can divert your mind to unstick yourself. So I've already said about changing your creative focus. Scott Barry Kaufman, a psychologist who is the scientific director of the Imagination Institute at the University of Pennsylvania, wrote a book called Wired to Create, says, one one feels writer's block. It's good to just keep putting things down on paper, ideas, knowledge, etc. And that's from a very, very helpful New Yorker article by Maria Konnikova called How to Beat Writer's Block. Highly recommend reading it. That's one of the reasons I like creating mind maps, is by putting stuff on paper. I'm coming at the subject from another angle. I'm actually visually being able to explore it. And I might draw connections between 
aspects of the subject that if I'd just written normal notes or bulleted lists, I'd never have noticed. So I really, really recommend mind maps as a way of getting your ideas down. Like Kaufman says, just keep putting things down on paper and ideas and knowledge, they're perfectly suited to creating mind maps. So how do you get unstuck? And this is something that I've, over the years, I've, I've actually addicted certain people on Form and 5090 to doing this. Aleatoric music. Music where decisions are made based on the throw of dice. So alia is Latin for dice. So you throw a die or a bunch of dice to determine the time signature or the tempo or the key of whatever it is you want to write. The chord progression, you might throw two six-sided dice and the first dice, if you throw a one, two or three, then you move up. And if you throw a four, five or six, you move down. And then the other die, you move down or up a number of steps depending on the throw of that die. So, you know, if you threw a one and then a four and then a five, then, hey, lucky you, you've just thrown the blues. Riaco Music says, Atitlan, try, ch try messing around with your workspace, change your environment. We're back to this wretched desk of mine, aren't we? You know, this is exactly why... I'm getting to the point now where I've I've had enough of being under the bed and getting I'm get, you know even though I cleaned the place up and as you can see you know it's it's still tidy but this thing gets in the way even with the foam rubber to uh, protect my head I need to get rid of it now enough's enough I need I need to change it M. Knight says, as soon as I drive through my closest city, I immediately get inspired. Going out for a drive is a fantastic way of unblocking yourself. I used to do that all the time when I lived in London. I'd go out, I used to have a Volkswagen Beetle. I'd, I'd just jump in the car and go off and drive down into Kent or Surrey for an hour or so. And I might have some music on the cassette player and whatever it was that I was trying to sort out in my head, just driving around for an hour would really, really unblock me. It was a really great, great way of, of doing stuff. So back to our creative tools. Change the dynamics or change, you know, determine the duration by throwing dice. Now, if you're a nerd like me, you may well have played Dungeons and Dragons in your time. And if you're a nerd like me, you may still have a D20 kicking around or D12s or any number of, you know, D4s, any number of other sided dice. <laughs> Chat now is just a, a, a string of people going, yep, yep, yay, verily. You are my people. Certainly, if you've got a 12-point musical scale, then a D12 is golden for that because you just throw it and you say, OK, what's the next note I'm going to play? 1 to 12, uh, sorted. Atitlan says there's websites for that. Ooh, please send me details, sir. Uh, that, that interests me. That definitely interests me. And rhythmic values. So there are uh, there's loads of different attributes of your composition that you can throw open to chance. That you can say, you know, yeah, the, me making the decision is holding me up. Therefore, I'm going to let the dice make the decision for me. And if you don't like the decision, throw the dice again. There's no law against it. So back to creative tools. These are some of the composers who used aleatoric techniques. You may recognise some of them as they were quite good at what they did. John Cage actually wrote a piece of music where some of the creative decisions were made by throwing yarrow stalks and consulting the I Ching. 
Pierre Boulez famously um, made a couple of compositions that were based on throwing dice. Uh, Boulez these days, or to you guys, might be better known as a conductor who conducted Frank Zappa's The Perfect Stranger Symphony. But Boulez was quite a force in the, the new wave of classical music composition in the in the middle of the 19th, uh, 19th century, the middle of the 20th century. Karl-Heinz Stockhausen, yeah, well, Frank Zappa worshipped the ground that Karl-Heinz Stockhausen walked on. Uh, his stuff is challenging, let's say. And Yanis Zanakis is not as well known, but he actually produced uh, a series of compositions that were based on stochastic rules. So not just aleatoric, but pure randomness. And he would actually employ computers to generate random seeds for his compositions. Amazing bloke. So that's passing control on to somebody else. The other thing is actually, and like Atitlan was saying about choice paralysis, reduce the number of choices that you've got. That might be as simple as don't use X. So for me, at the moment, it's don't use guitars, don't use basses, don't use the Chapman stick, don't use anything that requires the use of your left arm. And uh, as you saw from that chicken whisperer, it's taking me in creative areas that I probably wouldn't have been going in at this point during 5090 if I could just pick up the guitar and go, oh, I'll, I'll just create a riff. Because I can't do riffs at the moment. Um, my arms aren't up to it. So don't use X or use only Y. Come at it from the other direction. So limit yourself. Write a song using only the piano's black keys. There are quite a few famous songs that were indeed written only using the black keys on the piano. And I will leave finding at least one of those compositions as, as your homework for this week. You can go off and find them. Let me know which ones you find. So one of the big things in 5090 and form is to unblock people is they give them a challenge. The one that I really like is, is you take a song, you write the antithesis of the song where everything is the opposite. And then somebody else takes the original song and its antithesis and synthesizes a mixture of the two. So you end up with three songs for the price of one. Yay! Have a go at that if you've if you've never tried taking part in an anti sin challenge on fifty ninety. It's it's great fun. It's worth doing. I don't do them enough. Same with morphs. Somebody writes a song. Somebody else takes half of that song's elements and writes a new song out of them. Ignores the rest of the song or leaves half the song for somebody else to do. And then somebody else morphs their song into something else, and. It chains along until you end something that doesn't even remotely resemble the first song that started the chain in the first place. Ryako Music says, I love the form challenges. Those helped with the writer's block. They do. They're, they're great. Those two alone are great ways of just going, well, what if I did this instead? Another challenge that happens quite a lot in form, and I've actually issued a challenge myself for other people this year, and people have actually made some really interesting music as a result of it, is that your song must contain something that is specified in the challenge. It might be you go to the freesound.org website, which is a library of free samples that you can use to download. There's a random page. If you go to this page, it will give you a random sample. You then use that sample as the basis for a song. I got one when I went to it last night, which I'm going to work on. And um, What did I get? I got a 12-minute recording of Atmos from inside the main railway station in Frankfurt am Main. So that's what I'm going to be working on. I tend to do at least one wild-tracked song 
during every form of 5090. I love, especially in the summer, I don't get them very often, but sometimes I get really good thunderstorms around here. And I've got a little Foster uh, Tascam uh, DR40 audio recorder, and I chuck that on a tripod, open the window, and just leave it on the windowsill for 20 minutes or so, and then edit down the wild track noise that I've recorded, and that then becomes the background into a piece of music that I make. It's great fun. People really like it. I don't know why, whether it's that stepping outside the boundaries of what composition is or whether it's because it provides an insight into the sort of world that I live in because you're hearing it through your headphones. But um, really good fun actually playing with, with somebody else's samples and incorporating them. One challenge that... I actually went into this with loads and loads of ambitions to do a really good job on it and then actually got so inspired creatively that it just went on the back burner and I ended up forgetting about it entirely. Is the Amen Break, which is a drum break that lasts about eight seconds from a 1960s Motown hit called Amen Brother. And it's been sampled in so so many songs just google it or search for aim and break on youtube you will be bewildered by the number of examples you get and the challenge that i issued is my favorite the wilhelm scream do you know what the wilhelm scream is everybody because i can't resist giving you a taste of it so let's just should actually be squirreled away in here somewhere there it is of course this is the Wilhelm scream ah! M Knight said Ben Burt made it very popular he did he was sound designer for some very very popular films it's in Star Wars, the bit where Leia and Luke swing across the chasm when they're being shot at by stormtroopers. When Luke shoots the first stormtrooper, he does a Wilhelm scream as he falls off the platform. It's in Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's in all of Spielberg's films. It's, it's ridiculous. It's been in more than 400 movies to date and that number is going up every year christopher nolan used it in the batman movies it's in toy story it's in the most ludicrous places and as a nerd i have got to the point where if i hear <coughs> during a movie i'm almost compelled to shout out wilhelm scream m Knight says isn't it originally from an old western movie it is in fact, the Wilhelm that it is named after was not even the character who made the original noise, and it isn't even from the original movie. That's, that's what a long and twisted history it has. The mad folks at Samsung, Ryaka Music says, it's like that squeaky door sample in every movie. Yes, and the other one which I love is that there is a breed of raptor, a type of bird in California, called a red-tailed hawk. And it doesn't live in most of the places that cowboy movies are set. But if you watch a cowboy movie and there is a shot of some cliffs, it is absolutely required Hollywood sound editing practice that the red-tailed hawk's call should be added to the shot of the cliffs. And the other one that I love, and the best example I think of it, is that when somebody looks through a telescope, and get this, this is just utterly bizarre, but when somebody looks through a telescope at night at something in the night sky, a dog will bark. And you will even hear that happen during Star Trek First Contact, where Geordie shows James Cromwell the Enterprise in orbit. When he looks through the telescope, a dog barks. It's, it's wonderful stuff. Movie, 
cliches, movie sound cliches. Um, I can wander on about things like that for years, but that's another day. You might be given a specific subject to write a song about or a limited form. Last February, I took it upon myself to write A Villanelle, which is a bizarre 14 line. Is it 14 line or 17 line? It's it's a set number of lines and set numbered lines have to rhyme with each other. And the alternating rhymes in the body of the poem have to then be the final concluding two lines of the villanelle, which sounds really, really complicated. But you all know a villanelle because Dylan Thomas's Rage, Rage Against the Dying of the Light, which Michael Caine repeated ad nauseam in Christopher Nolan's film Interstellar, Dylan Thomas's The Dying of the Light is a villanelle. Not a lot of people know that. Or you might have a limited time period. February Album Writing Month and 5090 have things called skirmishes where you are given a title of a song and you have an hour to write a song and then post it on the site. It's not something I do because, well, you've seen the sort of stuff that I put together in Ableton. It usually takes me a bit longer than an hour, which is why if I'm going to do this form stock thing online, putting a song together in an hour, I'm going to have to put my pull my finger out a bit. But it's going to be fun. It's going to be a challenge. It's going to get me out of my comfort zone. And in terms of challenging yourself, getting yourself out of the comfort zone, forcing yourself to do something different is a great way of overcoming writer's block. Think outside the box. <laughs> That's glib. OK, what do I mean? Well, Graham Greene used to have horrendous problems with writer's block. And when he was a child, he went to Berkhampstead School and utterly loathed it, which was a bit embarrassing because his father was the headmaster at the time. It eventually got so bad that he ran away. He was caught quite quickly. He did, I think he only made it as far as the local playing fields. But his parents were so concerned that they put him into therapy. And the therapist told him to keep a dream journal, which he did for the rest of his life, because he found it so helpful. So you don't have to show it to anybody else. You probably wouldn't want to show it to anybody else. But it's a way of indulging in creative play, writing down what you dreamt. You may find it even makes your dreams better or more entertaining or more cinematic. Keep a dream journal. You might use social media for inspiration. And we're back to my Edinburgh lamp post. I've already written three songs as a result just of seeing a silly picture of notices plastered to a lamppost in Edinburgh. All right, one of them's rubbish, but the you know, Frog Juggler and Chicken Whisperer, I'm kind of proud of. Uh, so let's see if we can at least get three out of four with uh, Squirrel Matador, which is the only one left. Memes are another... And the other thing about memes is that if you write a song based on a meme, people will know. They will recognise... And if you want your song to have the possibility of going viral, writing a song about a meme is one of the most obvious, but potentially also one of the most effective ways of doing it. Same with trending hashtags. Somebody on form wrote a song about, or was it 5090, wrote the song about the guy who was the security guard at the Museum of the Old West and Cowboys? And this guy had basically misunderstood what a hashtag it was. So he'd actually written hashtag the cowboy at the end of every tweet that he posted on Twitter. And of course, it went absolutely viral. And he suddenly found himself with thousands of followers. It's fun. It's It can be, I mean, all right, hashtags do and have been 
weaponized, but the fun hashtags, great source of inspiration. Random images and photos, just pick a random page on Wikipedia. Keep an ideas notebook. I've got one here. I've, I've just got a little spiral bound notebook that, well, I mean, you've seen the number of spiral bound notebooks I have. I have one for, I have one for my live streams. I have one for notes on lectures and online courses I've done in music production. I've got one on lyrics. Well, I've got three on lyrics now because I've ended up being quite prolific since I started doing 1590 in form. But there's an example from me, and I've had three songs out of this so far, and there's a fourth on the way. So, yeah, that's 0131 is Edinburgh. I, I went and searched online, so I have a feeling that's somewhere up in Scotland. Could be wrong. Leave the editing till later. What do I mean about this? I mean, get the ideas down. Write the stuff. Don't Don't bother about judging whether it's good enough. Just do it. And when you've done one song, don't go back to it and fiddle with it. Just put it in the box and go off and do another one. And if one of those songs blocks you, then put it to one side and start another one. And if that blocks you, then start another one. And if and you see where I'm going with this, sleep on it. The number of scientific discoveries from the discovery of the structure of the benzene molecule by Kekulé and any number of things that Jung or Freud discovered or insights that they gained by sleeping on it rather than stressing out and worrying at the problem. Go to sleep, let your brain percolate on it in its own way. It works. Have a thing to come back to folder or file or box or ring binder or whatever else but be able to park stuff and then i think this is probably the last one sidestep your own internal judgment make now judge later so by that i mean focus on quantity not quality do not worry about quality much much as i'd like it to be my 50 90 output is not about quality it's about quantity it's about getting the numbers done Atitlan says revisiting stuff you've put aside is often productive absolutely mel says sleep is really important and you'll be amazed at how your brain will work out problems while you're unconscious m Knight says yep bunch of new projects called untitled one untitled 1.5 new song one okay song new song two new song two remake yeah, I'm exactly the same. I have stuff that goes back decades that occasionally I go back and listen to, although one of the problems I've hit recently is that they're in old file formats that I'm not altogether sure I can still read, but uh, that's another problem. You can cede control to something else. This is, again, well, I was talking about aleatoric music. I was saying, yeah, I'm not going to make that decision. I'm going to let the dice make that decision. Or I'm going to let opening a book at random and picking the third sentence on the left-hand page. Uh, seed control to something else. And if you want to be really sophisticated in the way that you seed control to something else, or in ways where you are told what to do in a strange and ambiguous fashion you can resort to oblique strategies yes we're back to oblique strategies again so i'm a nerd and a bit of a brian eno obsessive so i actually bought uh and this is the fifth edition from 2001 that Brian Eno and Peter Schmidt put together. So as you can see, it's a big, big deck of cards, and each each card has a compositional strategy on it. So what's this one says? Faced with a choice, do both. Or what to increase, what to reduce. Or is there something missing? or decorate decorate so that's me isn't it i did like one synth line is never enough uh most of my compositions for 5090 this year have had at least five synthesizer tracks on them <laughs> now is could that have been written for me or what 
abandon normal instruments. Uh, yeah. Courage, mon brave. Humanize something free of error. So, unquantize something, perhaps? Only a part, not the whole. How would you have done it? Give way to your worst impulse. Remove ambiguities and convert to specifics. So you can see some of them are pretty, pretty straightforward. Some of the others really aren't. And, and it's that gap in them that, um, that really appeals. And I noticed that this week's challenge on 5090 is to use oblique strategies. You don't have to spend 40 quid on a box like that. Thing of beauty though it is, because instead you can just go online. And if you go to that website, it will give you an oblique strategy when you click on it. And if you refresh, it will give you another one. And if I remember correctly, it actually has all the strategies from all five editions of the cards. So it's a very, very cool site. Um, but if you go to Eno Shop, uh, you can pick up your own very, very shiny box of Oblique Strategies cards. And uh, yes, I do like my Oblique Strategies cards. So summing up. If you've got writer's block, don't worry about it. Um, there's an emotional driver that is stopping you and worrying about it will only reinforce that emotional driver. So the thing to do is use some of the techniques that we've talked to earlier and and sidestep it. And in the end, just just do it. Don't be worried about the results. So what if it's rubbish? You know, as Mel was saying in her stream last night, you've got to write crap songs before you write any good ones. And if you know you've got to write a hundred crap songs before you start writing the good ones, then are you going to write the crap songs slowly over many, many decades? Or are you going to try and get the crap ones out of the way as quick as you reasonably and humanly can so you can start writing the cool stuff. I know which one I'd pick. I didn't. Not until I joined Form back in, what, 2009? And before I joined Form, I'd write one or two or three songs every five years. Sometimes it one or two or three songs every decade since I started writing or songs for February album writing month and 5090 I've written over 700 songs now or pieces of music because some of them were instrumentals and I've I can I can hear the improvement in what I what I'm doing there is nowhere near anything of the level that I'm doing now in anything I was doing even five years ago. I've, I've just leaps and bounds forward, he said modestly. But, you know, I'm, I'm just stating a fact. I, I'm doing stuff now that I could not have done even five years ago. And in some cases, I have no idea how I'm doing it. But it's doing it that's the important bit. And that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes... Chris's little seminar on how to overcome writer's block. It will be available in its entirety, apart from the edited out hesitations, repetitions, and me going ums, um, like that one, on YouTube. So thanks for watching on that. Rioco Music says, thanks, Professor Harris. As always, I aim to please. No, I, I enjoy doing these, and to be honest... I want to help people get to the point where I'm at. You know, I, I, I don't want to be the only person. Well, I'm certainly by no means the only person doing this sort of stuff. But, uh, yeah, just do it 
and to give you some idea to give you some idea and this is this is what mel and i were talking about and uh, i don't know how many of the others out there are watching who were on um, mel's show yesterday but um i found them all up wgb band dead end love i have not played this uh mel shall i play this because <laughs> i'm gonna take that as a yes i i cannot remember anything about this whatsoever Riaka Music says, go ahead. Okay, this is going to be a learning experience for me because what's let's let's find out when this was created. So file properties. Created May no, that's so yeah. Modified twelfth of March two thousand and eight. That sounds about right, you know. So this is twelve years ago. first time i've listened to that in probably 10 years um it will probably be another 10 years before i listen to it again you don't sound terrible at all no and and like i say you can really tell 
even back that back then that it's like yeah yeah we we have a singer here folks uh, certainly more so than the i mean all props to our dear friend split coil but uh the when the french vacation uh which is spit coil spit coil doing a very laconic drawl i don't we, we'll spare you that one the uh your array of emotion says that didn't sound half bad. No, it didn't. It didn't at all. Right. Shall we see if Ableton is is playing playing ball now? Open recent set. I was going to play you just the solo synth and the Celeste. Let's be real, our WGB song was the best. Absolutely, Mel. Absolutely. Um, I've even got a copy of the one that we recorded uh, with Minkzilla in Vancouver in the presence of Mr. Gibson himself, uh, which was called Shitty Pink Cable. And... Yeah, I'll, I'll spare you that one. Right, Ableton, speak to me. Are you there? Ha-ha! Ableton is there. Right, so let's solo the piano and then the Celeste. Because I rather liked the way these two played together. And the fun thing is that People keep on commenting on 5090 about the bells, but as you can see, there are no tubular bells on this track whatsoever. I was very restrained. horns that are being piped pretty much straight the way into Sende, which is native instruments rather exceptionally brilliant reverb unit realm uh, which i i actually have as a default reverb on my my Sende now i like it that much i am such a native instruments fanboy these days it's just not true but uh yeah I, I had great fun doing this, but as I said, I have absolutely no idea where all of this came from, other than the fact that I suddenly found myself working with a fairly massive constraint for me. Because, I mean, if you look at that lot, I kind of like my guitars and my basses and my Chapman stick. And strings and stuff are pretty much what what I like doing. So since whatever I did to this happened, I can't use those without pain. So the the Ableton stuff that that you see in in this lot is, you know, this is all it's all done on keyboards or on the push which is as i've said many times uh such an interesting compositional tool i never thought i'd use it in the way that i did i had great dreams and visions of being able to play blistering keyboard solos on it as um jordan rudess does in the uh, Bad News Jitterbug video that he did with the guys from Project RNL. Uh, if you search on YouTube for Ayal Amir, Bad News Jitterbug, uh, Ayal is E-Y-A-L and then A-M-I-R. 
Uh, it's a cracking song. And those guys are some of the most talented musicians I have ever met. And they record at home and do stuff that is, without exception, jaw-dropping. So they do... They do a version... Oh, hi, French Doge. No problem, mate. Um, I've covered the writer's block bit, but uh, we'll, uh, it will be available on Twitch afterwards and whatever else. Uh, just talking about uh, Project RNL. They do a version of Hansen's Mbop, but they do it as if it had been recorded by Queen with Mac doing the production and they call it Hansonian Rhapsody and check it out on YouTube again it is a thing of pure joy and yeah just without exception they are incredibly gifted musicians and um, they played the fleece in Bristol a couple of years ago and I was able to um, fanboy out completely and they even signed a couple of CDs from me for me, so thanks, thanks, Project RNL guys. But um, yeah, so this stuff is not at all what I would normally make, and I'm kind of digging it, especially you know when it gets completely over the top, and I'm <laughs> excuse me when I'm going in full Philip Glass mode. Whoops. We've played one, um, as it's you, Jules, we'll, we'll play you the uh, When the French Vacation, if I can find it. It's on one of these. No, it's not that one. This system has six hard drives on it now. It is getting a little bit out of hand. Here we go. Voila. Couple kids from Gay Paris jet across the pond and run around and look for me. In the pub all afternoon, out to the lake to tease the rodents and pose for you. Everything in black and white, more footage than the stones and beetles come by. Gigabytes on demand Better get broadband When the French vacation The world pays attention Yeah, when the French vacation The world pays attention I took a plane to Chi-Town once Got off and looked around, saw some art, did the clubs round town. Went to Denver, Kalamazoo, did the URL thing, the Maple Leaf backpack too. Got home and mowed lawn, checked my machine, and nobody knew that I was gone. Who oh, went the French vacation? Who oh, will lose attention? Yeah, when the French vacation, the world pays attention. Bleak. Up 
Once the French were on a sticky wicket, the man failure to be any kind of sheep. I'm dressed in the style of Helen Clinton. I hit a room as no one may see. All coffee squid and tentacles for breakfast. Means all that Louis says is. Be- With much ado, the selling authors lining up to buy the food. The film's gonna be out in the spring. Brad and Angelina did the whole thing for free. Cause when the French vacation, the world pays attention. Yeah, when the French vacation, the world pays attention. The world pays attention. Yeah, that accordion is actually the um, JX3P at the top there, uh, which had a ray of emotion says, play play the one you played earlier again. Oh, go on then. So, uh, yeah, and Jules, if your dad is around, uh, see if he can spot the Chapman stick on this. Uh, where, where did I... Is it... And you, you notice, and I, I'm sure I can. I I can probably embarrass Louis with this because this. I mean, I've got loads of samples that he sent me. Beak. Remember the uh, WGB's squid fascination, right? Um, I've got a headfirst remix here, which I don't think was what I played earlier. So let's let's hear what this sounds like. Go. Yeah. 
be any more 80s despite the fact that that was recorded in what 2008 um Ryako music says again laptop internal mic lol oh we were so young and ambitious and didn't have the gear that we've got now but it didn't matter because you work with what you've got and everything you do you learn a little bit more and Certainly, I mean, even doing that, that was probably working on those tracks that kicked me into taking part in February Album Writing Month in 5090 a couple of years later. But, uh, good Lord. <laughs> All right, in, in defence, it was 12 years ago. Um, yeah, I'm. if I can find... Have I got all the stems to that? Let's just have a look. So what have we got here? It looks like I've got a whole bunch of MP3 files there that look as if from the labels they are the stems. You know what? I might, just for stuff and giggles, I might actually try try putting something together um, in, in Ableton from some of these stems with due processing and and consideration for the extension of time. My dad also has the song of you all reading, I think. I wonder which one that is. I, 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 I actually have a folder here which is full of... You see all this stuff? It says NPK on it. That's N-Track. So those are... Um, those are end track analysis files, which was what I was using for creating. That was my DAW back then. It's still kicking around and it's still really good. Um, you want to hear Dead End Love again? Where, where, where was that? There it is. Here we go then. Don't 
So uh, I've just dug out my uh, Flickr stream of, uh, when was this? Fe oh, February the 4th. It seems like a lifetime ago. So there is the esteemed author, Mr. William Gibson and Meru and Array of Emotions having their book signed and giving Bill CDs and various other people. In fact, I think there's... There we go. There's Guppy Wigber and her dad as well. And Remote Push and Georgie and Fashpo and loads and loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of other people that we all know. Array of Emotions says, ah, oh, February, when the world was a more innocent place. And Riaco Music says, remember when we could still travel? God, I remember those days. There's Jan, who was the guy who invented the nickname Hubertus Bellend for Dominic Cummings, uh, which chuffed Bill so much that he referenced it at every interview that he gave, uh, much to the amusement of all of us. <laughs> Travel will be happening again in Flight Simulator 2020. Man, I cannot wait to get my hands on that software. That looks absolutely mind-blowing procedurally generated landscapes from Bing in three dimensions from satellite photographies of the entire freaking planet um i yeah m night says it's beautiful it i don't really do youtube videos of other people's stuff but i will quite happily sit there and have done for an hour just watching somebody else fly around in Flight Simulator 2020 uh, around Vancouver, uh, not Vancouver, around Seattle, which I know the area because Boeing. And uh, oh, Doge friend, French Doge says, me too, can't wait to travel the world in it. Same. And of course, you know, the first thing I'm going to do is fly over the house and see how old the satellite imagery is. See, see which plants I've got in the back garden and whether the conservatory exists. Because I'm sad. But, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, Mel says, that's crazy. You haven't seen the half of it. Just, just, just go on YouTube and get it on the telly. Biggest screen you've, biggest screen you can muster. And just be amazed. It looks glorious. So, yes, so we've had I Will Follow Him and Dead End Love and When the French Vacation. Um, Jules, the one you mention, I did, did, did I, did that pass me by? Because I do not remember that at all, that, that we read, read stuff out. Um, unless it's in any of the, no, see, that's just... So I've got your dad's drum and bass here. This is Jules's dad. Who 
didn't know how to use compression. And that's, that's all that is. So, yeah, very, very odd. May if it was early on, ah, yeah, a ray of emotion says, I know your dad was one of the very early members, so maybe it was before we all joined. I bet it was. Um, that because because I don't I don't have that at all, and I was quite obsessive about recording William Gibson stuff, as you see from from this screen. I've got various various mp3 files of and it and even a quick time movie of the agrippa self-destructing poem that bill created uh the bbc radio dramatization of pattern recognition and a whole bunch of interviews and stuff so fash pose in it for sure and striv and luminous and woodrow not sure okay that's intrigued me now. I I would love to hear that, because um, I would imagine that will probably be very very amusing, and probably of limited appeal to the non-William Gibson uh, discussion board aficionados here tonight, for which I apologise, guys. So where are we? Good Lord, I've been doing this for two hours. Where did that go? Bah. Array of emotion says, shut up, pattern recognition is amazing. I I think it is. I, much as I like the the current, um, the peripheral and agency, I think the Blue Ant trilogy are absolute works of genius. But, I mean, Bill is a genius, so we all know this. But I really, really, really dig... William Gibson's Pattern Recognition, Spook Country, and Zero History. If you want to read three really, really weird looks at an almost contemporary version of London, then those books are seriously worth checking out. Riaco Music says, Pattern Recognition was my first introduction to Gibson. I did not know that. Oh, wow. Okay. I am an old git. And I bought Neuromancer when it came out in paperback in the 80s. And I used to buy Omni magazine and I've still got loads of old copies of Omni from the 1970s. Well, it started 79 and went into the early 80s. And I've got, I've got an issue downstairs with a short story called Sand Kings by a guy who I thought showed quite good promise as a writer of sort of science fiction and fantasy fiction a guy called george r r martin but there is an issue of omni that has burning chrome in it i think it is and for some reason i don't have that in my collection of copies of omni and boy did that bug me when i thought that issue's missing so who knows Array of Emotion says, I'm kind of meh on spook country, but yeah, pattern recognition might be my favourite of all of his books. Guppy Wigbo says, my first was Idaru. I love Idaru. And there is a reference in that. And every time Bill does a tour, I keep meaning to ask Bill who he meant when he writes about the English rock and roll star dressed in tweed. And... I can't decide whether he means Ian Anderson from Jethro Tull or somebody from Led Zeppelin or or he obviously means or you know is it Roger Daltrey there are so many candidates that it could be and I I would love to know who Bill was thinking of when he just has the protagonist meet um, this English rock star who's dressed in tweed because uh, I would love to know who it was B 
It was based on U2, I believe. Bono, says Guppy Wigba. Now, that's interesting. That is... Yeah, that would make sense. And, and given the humongousness of U2's reputation at the time, then... Yeah, OK. Bono in Tweed, though. Not a good look for him. So, where are we? We are at... 21.32 UK time, so that's 22.32 Central European time and various other times wherever you are. Um, are there any other, are there other, any other random delves into the dim and distant past that, uh, that we should cover this evening? It's, it's kind of going in that sort of whole nostalgia retro way isn't it um what i can do have i got some of my no maybe maybe not it'll take me too long to find it we'll, we'll leave that for another time ah guppy Bugger says the low res fan club which is written about in the text is a parallel of wire which is u2 fan club i think anyway yes yes it was uh, although wire is is or the wire is also a uk music magazine um, and a moment of silence please for the passing of one of the uk's most revered and occasionally controversial but always interesting music publications Q magazine published its last ever edition this month. Um, it was originally started by Mark Ellen and David Hepworth, I believe, when the Beeb closed down the old Grey Whistle Test and they decided to do a music magazine instead. Could be wrong, but uh, I used to buy it religiously. And up until a couple of years ago, I had most of the first. 150, 200 uh, editions of it in IKEA paper um, file folders in the front bedroom. And I eventually got to the point where it's, I haven't looked at these in 15 years. Why are they taking up space and stressing out the f structure of the house? Because magazines in files are heavy, heavy things. So I got rid of them all. Atitlan says, used to get Q all the time in the 90s. Yep, same here. I must admit, I've still got all of the cover CDs and cassettes that that came with Q back in the day. Uh, but, um, yeah, buying a magazine to read about music has just become something that... <laughs> Rieko Music says analog. Yeah, absolutely, mate. It's just become something that, why would you do that anymore? We've got the, the internet and our phones and stuff. And it's kind of sad and really brings home to me that a lot of the stuff that that used to be an integral part of my life is outdated and defunct. And I found a box of three and a half inch floppy disks while I was cleaning up yesterday and thought I don't have any computers in the house that have three and a half inch disk drives other than uh, an old gateway 386 in the loft that ran Windows ME that's how old it was um Guppy Wigber says, plus it's so expensive. Yeah, and paper, glossy paper, thick glossy paper with free gifts of calendars and photograph books and cassettes and CDs. And I do still subscribe to several physical magazines. I've been a subscriber to the 40 and Times for at least 30 years now. Uh, I subscribe to Prog magazine because Prog. And uh, Rioja Music says stuff to hang on your walls. Yeah, as if I've got space on my walls to hang stuff in here now. But uh, yeah, good point. 
yeah magazines but do i where do i get my music information from these days is to coin a phrase straight from the horse's mouth because most of the artists that i like i follow on facebook or twitter or twitch or all three and if they do something you know in devon townsend's case i can watch him do it on camera from his studio on twitch which is it gives an immediacy that a magazine that takes two weeks to put together a week to print and a week to distribute is never going to compete with so and that's why prog has sort of taken upon itself more as a role of curation and archival rather than here's what's happening this week you know i've up until i threw a lot of stuff out and i in tidying this place up and getting rid of the bookcase in the corner over there i had boxes of copies of sounds the music newspaper from the 70s you know i found one and the headline was sabs split up which was when ozzy osbourne first left black sabbath um although uh, you know as we know sabbath just went well so do you we'll get another singer and got a certain mr ronnie james dio to fill the uh, fill the boots of mr osbourne which did not please ozzy let's say uh, i went and saw ozzy's subsequent band blizzard of oz at the hammersmith odeon and 29 no 39 years ago on the first ozzy osbourne's blizzard of oz supported motorhead at the heavy metal holocaust at port vale football ground in stoke on trent and uh, i was there and helen was there and we were talking about it at the weekend and she's, somebody she knew had just sent her a whole bunch of photographs that had obviously been taken backstage during that day and she was going, i don't remember half of this I was like, mm, same uh, my overwhelming memory was of watching ozzy set from out in the crowd and girl school had turned up for the day i don't remember them performing they were certainly there um i i don't think they were on the bill so whether they were a surprise guest who just did a set or or what i'm not sure but they were definitely there and in front of us were three guys in fishtail parkers so they were dressed completely as mods and people looked at them and didn't give them a second glance but i knew because i'd been chatting with them backstage <laughs> name drop i'd been dropping uh, chatting with them backstage half an hour beforehand it was three guys from triumph who'd been on stage in their velour jackets and spandex trousers uh, doing a really, really fine version of Canadian pomp rock uh, for the delectation and delight of the masses about 45 minutes earlier. Nobody recognised them because heavy metal, it's all about uniforms. You know, leather jacket, denim jacket with all the patches on it. You wore a parka you were something else you weren't part of the culture so you were ignored and the guys from triumph smart lads had cottoned on to that fact so they got three fishtail parkers and they could have been wearing space suits or you know predator camouflage suits um, it just made them invisible it was absolutely fascinating to watch um, and it was really cool being in on the joke because they knew that we knew that they who they were and yeah whatever else happy days good god 39 years ago um still have memories of meeting ozzy osbourne lights on nobody home um and in complete comparison uh, frank marino late of mahogany rush fame who had just released a cracking solo album and he was lovely and just sat and chatted signed the program for me everything else top bloke and he's still going he's still making great music so check him out as well 
<laughs> a ray of emotion says, yeah, sounds like Aussie, all right. Yeah, um, I still remember standing watching, and it would probably have been watching Triumph on stage, and there were a pair of elbows on the hoarding behind me, um, which I leant back on and accidentally clonked myself, and the guy apologised. And it was Randy Rhodes. It was one of the last shows that he did. I never saw him perform live again because uh, he was killed in a very stupid plane crash uh, on the subsequent American tour. And that was, he was a talent. I mean, my goodness me, what would he be doing now? If he hadn't been killed, where would he have taken heavy metal rock guitar? because he was doing things on those Blizzard of Oz albums that everybody else was, were, you know, guitarists that I knew were just going, what? what? <laughs> What's this guy doing? Where did that come from? Absolutely extraordinary talent and so young as well. But uh, somebody else posted me a, a meme on Facebook this evening which had the photograph of the Beatles giving their ages when they finished recording their last album. And I think the... Who was the eldest of the Beatles? Was it John? Was like 28. It's like they're all in their mid to late 20s. And it's like, oh, God. Um, Riaco Music says, Tonight has been full of reminiscing. Yeah, I'm in that headspace. So, for those of you who may not know, although I have mentioned it before, um, I run out of my 50s on Tuesday. So, I become 60 years old on Tuesday. And I'm kind of handling it. But, you know, aches and pains and just general physical condition. Um, I'm not a young guy anymore. And it's... Riaka Music says it's a big deal. I've been kind of in denial that it's a big deal, but yeah, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. So, uh, yeah, will I completely lose it on Tuesday? Who knows? I'll be doing the 5090 show again on Sunday. Uh, so, M. Knight says, Oh man, will you stream before your birthday? Yes. I will be streaming the 5090 show as per usual, 2100 BST on Twitch on Sunday night. Uh, and then I will be back here doing the regular headfirst only show on Twitch at 1930 BST UK time on Thursday. So... Uh, yeah, it. Guppy Bugbear says, "Really? Why?" It gets to the point where, all right, it's the having birthdays is nice given the alternative. Put it like this, but when you start realizing, and this was brought home, strangely enough, going over to Louis's birthday twelve years ago. Was it twelve years ago? No. 2012, so eight years ago, going over to see Louis and Emily in uh, Vancouver for Louis's 30th birthday because William Gibson, and of course William Gibson was at Louis's 30th birthday party because that's who Louis is. And we all went out and had a barbecue in one of the parks in Vancouver. And somebody had brought a frisbee along. I'm trying to remember who it was, whether it was Jerome or whether it was someone else. And all the young kids went out and started playing frisbee. And I used to be in the UK Frisbee Association because I'm a nerd and I still have an armful of different frisbees of different sorts because yes there are different sorts and there are different competition weights and let's not go down that rabbit hole so of course me being me decided i'd go and show these young 
these young whippersnappers my frisbee chops. And the next day I couldn't walk. And it, that is the point, I think. Um, plus the fact that I was grossly overweight. I weighed 40, 40 or 45 pounds more than I do now. Um, but that was the point where I realised, you know what? You're not a young guy anymore. And at that point, I could then console myself with the point of saying, yeah, but I'm still middle-aged. But when you hit 60, you can't really say you're middle-aged anymore. So it's kind of a, a big deal. Guppy Wigber says, do you feel there is a big difference between 49 and 50? Yes, good question. Um, in simple terms, no. The, the, the really traumatic ones for me um, was hitting 30. Uh, th my 30th birthday, I that was... If I had to pick a word that summed up my 30th birthday, it would be angst. Because at the time I was single, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I was just in a sort of job that was okay and it paid the bills and everything else. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> five, five years after that, I was divorced and in a completely different job and in a completely different house. And pretty much every aspect of my life had changed. And I think the fallout from that l led me from 35 probably to 50 of just going, yeah, golden now. 50 was, yeah, that was, that was okay, you know, because I was, I was in a much better place than I had been at 30 and probably even at 40. Um, but 60 just feels... Just, you know, I mean, I start getting perks like a pension because I made a few good decisions when I was a lot younger. So it's like suddenly it's like, you know what, I can retire. All right, I'm still doing consultancy work at the moment. Um, that's always nice to, to have a bit more money coming in. But yeah, I start drawing a pension next week. How'd that happen? Because I, I, on Facebook earlier, I posted a picture of me on a skiing holiday from 1989. And kind of my self-image is, is that guy of, you know, of being 30, 30 odd years, 39, 40 years old. And another 20 years on top of that has taken its toll somewhat. Although I do try and look after myself these days. The ray of emotion says yikes. Yeah, yeah, it is yikes. Is is probably the reaction that I've got on my head at the moment. But yeah, I'm I'm dealing with it, you know. And I have very few stress drivers at the moment, although I have bizarre anxiety dreams at the moment. I had the weirdest dream last week. Got to tell you this before we close down for the day had this real, really full-on anxiety dream. And I specialise in anxiety dreams. The dreams where you're trying to do something and everything stops you from achieving that goal. You know, I went to... I, I had one dream of, of trying to visit someone and the Earth's gravity flipped through... 90 degrees so I was actually having to mountaineer up the road to the house I, what's with that so the dream I had last week and, and I had no, I have no recollection of reading about listening to or watching any programs about David Bowie but I found myself traipsing round South London on a Saturday night with David Bowie and we were trying to look for a party that we'd both heard about that we neither of us had been invited to but which we had both decided that we were going to crash and 
basically we we decided they'd let us in because David Bowie. Why wouldn't you? And it just got progressively weirder and weirder, and we ended up on a double decker bus, and and it was it was like the the young ones, and I don't mean the Bristol filmed television series with Aid Edmondson and Rick Mail and Nigel Planer and um, the other guy. I am so sorry, the guy who plays Mike. I have completely forgotten your name. I will remember it in a minute. I, I am not talking about that, the young ones. I am talking about the Cliff Richards, the young ones, and I'm talking about Summer Holiday. It was that kind of vibe, but with me and David Bowie trying to get to a party. I, it's It's just, where did that come from? So... That's the kind of dream I've been having at the moment. Maybe I should cut down on the cheese before bedtime. Probably a lesson there. Riako Music says, this dream should have happened in real life. Absolutely. Guppy Wigber says, you're healthy and happy, right? Well, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm happy. The health things, I have issues. You know, I've got um, a 1.3 centimetre stone in my left kidney. Uh, which I think is probably a result of driving to and from work two hours each way in the car three, four days a week in my last job. So that's kind of putting me off driving long distances or even commuting or even getting another job. And, uh, and I've got a cyst on this kidney, which is the thing actually that's been giving me more grief than the kidney stones, which is why apart from the stuff that I've just spilled over my leg, I'm drinking huge amounts of fluids. I was told basically by the surgeon, uh, no chocolate, no nuts, cut down on eating meat and drink at least three litres, two and a half, three litres of fluids a day. Sadly, non-alcoholic fluids as well, which, um, yeah, it doesn't always apply at weekends and it sure as hell ain't going to apply next Tuesday. I'm just going to put that out there right now. So, um, yes, lots of reminiscence, lots of talking about me, which is something that I kind of quite, quite unusual, really, I think. Uh, I try to avoid it, but um, yeah, it happened. So I'm obviously in a very strange headspace at the moment, but yeah, I'm in a good one. Ryako Music says, it's time to celebrate. Um, you better make exceptions on your birthday. I'll tell you what, mate. Uh, I fell off the wagon this evening because I have found my Achilles heel in terms of no chocolate. Because there is a new dessert in town, or at least on the shelves in Tesco, when I went round the shelves of Tesco yesterday. After eight desserts. And it's basically a mint mousse with big swirly lumps of after eight in them and they're even better than you think Ryako music is just saying and i'll just allow it because so Ryako music's reaction is stfu and yes absolutely they are gorgeous so i had one for my tea so yeah my weight loss which has been going fairly nicely for the last couple of years may have a little wiggle or two in the next week but who knows aha right okay so yes Bo Morris honky big castle uh also has an ice cream parlor called the red boat ice cream parlor and they make their own ice cream and they make after eight ice cream. So I, yeah. If there is one item of chocolate that I really, really, really am in no, no rush to give up for health reasons or anything else ever, it's after eight mints because I love them. So anyway. With that, and the fact that although I can see you all saying, yeah, you're back, 
OBS is saying, you have zero viewers and your stream duration is now zero, zero. Um, I have a feeling OBS is unhappy. So it's probably, given the fact that I've been streaming for two and a half hours, time to bid adieu, says Mel. I think you're absolutely right. So I will do exactly that. I will see you all on Sunday. If I don't see you all on Sunday, I will see you on Thursday. And if I don't see you on Thursday or Sunday, then look after yourselves. And wherever you are, stay safe, stay well, and stay sane. Because it's an absolutely strange world out there at the moment. And we all need to look after each other. So take care, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>